get started here, uh, there must be something, no pun intended, in the air. Our <laughs> president, Karen McKee, isn't feeling well today, so she's not here to greet us, to open up. Uh, and uh, Mark Heiss from the Yellow Springs, the Yellow Springer T-shirts and promotions is not able to be with us. And maybe Eric Clark uh, from the Fossil Shop uh, will show up, but uh, we should get going. I'm Don Hollister of the James A. McKee Association, and we have a small enough group. I'd like to just do a quick introduction, you know, just say your name around the room, and then I'll introduce the panel and we'll get rolling. David Robineau. Pam Kanine. Don <coughs> Hollister. Jerry Sutton. Michael Slaughter. Chris Meacher. Philip O'Rourke. Valerie Koshula. Laura Curlis. John Fleming. Lee Huffington. Peggy <coughs> Erskine. Tosh Camp. Melissa Camp. Todd Camp. Mm -hmm. Mark Carr. Mm -hmm. Paul Abendroff. <coughs> Jamie Sharp. Corey Van Ostel. Brian Katie. <laughs> and Brian's official name is Listen to the Wind Media? Yeah, that's my, my business name. That, I'm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're at Osdo, it's Black Cap Electric. Electric. Yeah. And Jamie Sharp, it's Yellow Springs Toy Company. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> uh, it's sort of open-ended. We have a smaller panel than originally planned, so I won't crack a whip at five minutes. But if each of you would just say something about how you started, uh, or you could twist that any way you want. Uh, one of the things I want to hear out of, of from the panel or the discussion, the questions and answers, uh, is if there was someone thinking of starting a business, or what what barriers do you see, and what what extra tips would you suggest? Anyway, you started a business. That start with me. I was waiting to see what these would do, so I can get a good <laughs> idea of the format. Um, I'm Brian Katie. I have listened to the Wind Media web design. I've had the business now for about 10 years. Uh, basically, real quick history, I grew up in Yellow Springs, uh, went to school at Ohio University. Uh, after that, I worked out at CNN for about uh, 18 years, I guess. Uh, got burned out of CNN, had a typical, I wouldn't call it a midlife crisis, but I just wanted to take some time off. And um, so I decided to pull up my stakes in Atlanta, come back here, and then I did some traveling uh, around the country for a few years. And when I did that, I created a travel blog website. And um, that's how I got started in web design. Um, as far as, um, thing, as far as things went, um, the original plan of getting a web design or a web uh, job in a television station, which was kind of the plan afterwards, really didn't fell through. It uh, logically wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna be a good fit um, at the time. So um, when I came back here, I just started um, to see people that needed websites built. Uh, first it was family members, then it was some other people, and I literally just went on. There's so many good um, resources for training yourself these days. I literally went on LinkedIn and learned how to code HTML myself, and, um, and then built a website uh, for my stepmother for her farm, and then um, it actually 
developed into another news site for another relative. And then from there, I just started picking up business with people um, in town and out of and out of town. And it um, so it just pretty much at some point it seemed like a logical fit. You know, I, I was getting enough business to um, pull me over, and I was needed actually in town by relatives as things turned out. So it turned out to be a good uh, business to do from home. As far as barriers to starting a business in Yellow Springs, we're a little different, I think, because both of you have storefronts. You don't have a storefront. Um, so you, well, then we might be on the same page. Um, I kind of tell people who are looking for new jobs that there is a um, you don't, you don't necessarily have to go back to college to start a new career if you're in um, your middle years. If you're a self-starter, which I think a lot of people that run businesses are, um, you, can get, you can start your own business um, and learn, basically learn from um, what you have around you, from the resources of people, websites and, uh, and such. As far as uh, Yellow Springs, Yellow Springs is really good about word of mouth. So, you know, I think with any business, you, you want to have good word of mouth, but I think in Yellow Springs it's very important to have good word of mouth. And that's what helped me to uh, get additional clients and, um, and basically, that's it. I mean, that's the best way to um, describe what I do. And I don't know if you have a specific question I'm going to have to answer. I'd like to hold the questions until we go through everybody and then gotcha. we get interested. Okay, I'll go next. I'm Corey Nostal. My business is called Black Cap Electric. We're um, contractors to the utility companies. Um, so my first business was, I started when I was 25, and that was a retail store. It was an underwear and swimwear store that my best friend and I started together, and that was, I was just right out of college. I think I've always been one of those people that's just interested in how things work, and kind of would, I, you know, worked in a lot of restaurant work, and was acting, and stuff in my 20s, and, um, and all my friends were artists, and being an artist and being an actor is also being an independent business person. Um, and so my best friend and I, she's a visual artist, we just had a storefront that was available and we said, all right, um, if we say we're open, one of us has to be there, okay. And, <laughs> and then just asked everyone that we knew, how do you start a business, how do you start a business? And so a friend who had started a business kind of helped us make a checklist of things to do and we waited in lines at City Hall to get business licenses. And, um, and somebody else said, okay, save all the receipts. Everything that you spent, just save the receipts. And then about a month into it, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with these receipts? <laughs> so I went to uh, Office Depot and I got a ledger and you know, I took all the receipts and I just filled out the ledger by hand and suddenly I had expense categories and suddenly I had basic bookkeeping and an understanding of that. So I really started, and I, I'm so grateful for that because um, as things have grown, I really think back to that, and that really is just the foundation of it. And as my kids, who are both sort of entrepreneurial, my daughter has a um, paleta, like a popsicle business that she runs, and um, she and her friend, and so since about second grade, she's been paying for all of her own expenses. She's turned a profit you know, from day one. So I'm really proud of that. Um, my second business, about six years after starting that store, um, I was then, I had a kid, and um, it was not as fun as it had been to work all the time and not make any money. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, my business partner and I sat across from the table from each other and um, you know wrote numbers on a piece of paper and turned them upside down and slid them across just like we'd seen in the movies and they were <laughs> far apart. We met kind of in the middle and made a payment plan and she bought me out. Um, and so I made a little bit of money on that. And she still has the store going to this day, which makes me really proud. There was a need, she's grown, she expanded, 
She's had two additional partners since, since me, and that makes me feel really proud that there was a need for that. So my second business made even less money. That was a theater. Um, and that was because I thought, okay, well, what I really want to do is acting and directing and writing, so why don't I just have my own space, and then I can just put on shows and have a space for my friends, and we'll all put on shows. It'll be really fun. And um, about six months into doing that, my mom got sick, and so I came back here. I was in Kansas City and um, kind of gave that business away to a friend to run and came back here and took care of her. Um, and then when then I had my second kid and started teaching at Friends Music Camp and it just and was still living in Kansas City and I needed a bridge to come back here so I contacted my stepbrother who had a utility contracting company for Dayton Power and Light and I said, can I do your books? Um, can I help you on the back end? Um, and so that was kind of my bridge to move back here with my family. And so time went on. Um, I learned that his business was not, he, you know, he wasn't paying his taxes and things like that that you need to do. So his business ended up going under. And in the wake of that, he said, why don't you just, you know how this business works. I had audited all of the systems. I started up you know, benefits plans and done. I knew the whole back end of it. I just didn't know anything about the front end. So um, I did that. So that was July when his company went under. I was teaching at Friends Music Camp July 16. And then I came back here and just sat down at my desk and worked and worked and worked for a month and then won, won contracts, won my first contracts. And so now five years later, um, after kind of cruising similarly but restructuring how the business was run that he, that he had run and re kind of making it my own, doing things better, um, then I won a contract, to, a five-year contract in Indianapolis and then we just got another contract to, to exchange all the meters in Dayton. So, we're growing, it's been exciting, and I kind of feel like there's a runaway train and I'm just trying to hold on. So my <laughs> biggest advice is, it goes back to that, ask people who've already done it for help, take their advice um, if it makes sense, or <laughs> if it doesn't make sense, ask somebody else, and if they say the same thing, it probably is true. Um, get help, definitely get an accountant that you trust, that you can um, set the business up, structure it properly from the beginning, so that you don't have to go back and change things later on. Um, and then, like for me, each phase of growth right now, because this is just, it's its really, um, like, it's just growing. I'm kind of like trying to figure out what my role is right now, because um, the advice that I got when I, I attended a workshop about succession planning at a very, because I, I really like starting businesses um, when it's like turning the crank and maintaining the systems. I start to feel a little bit antsy. It's less exciting to me and less interesting to me. So I always feel like I have to know what's going to be, how am I going to get out of this <laughs> this business that I've gotten myself into because I, I think it's it's not as fun for me. So this succession planner is somebody who I've been working with. It's, he's out of Kent State and he's helped me kind of visualize what the what the growth plan is for the company and how what my exit strategy is from it too and so I'm kind of working through those steps right now. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Um, I'm Jamie Sharp. I own the Yellow Springs Toy Company. We opened uh, March of 2018 and I celebrated my second birthday during COVID shutdown. So this has been a really challenging time. Um, the toy store to me is almost like the perfect storm. You know, you go through your life feeling like, why am I doing this? Is this, really, I have to learn this? And you know, and I had a bunch of different careers. And this sort of is the spot that all of the skills and everything that I've built throughout my career have kind of come home to roost. Um, so I have a, one of those really useful degrees in fine art, and um, I waited tables and bartended all, to pay my way through college. And then I started out in the arts administration field. John was an early employer of me in that uh, field at the National Afro-American Museum. But I worked in museums and for arts organizations in their education departments and was really interested in how to engage people, how to stimulate people's mind in a creative way. But I learned early on that it's really hard to support yourself on a nonprofit salary, and I always had some graphic design expertise and 
and had been doing some freelance work on my own for years. And a position came available uh, where I was the production manager of a publishing company that published books and magazines. And so I did all the graphic design and some marketing for that and oversaw the process and other designers and editors to bring these publications to press. And I did that for 12 years and the company sold and, um, I, did, and I lost my position. I was the longest term, best paid employee and they just started making some financial decisions. So I found myself unemployed and um, it was a, kind of a crazy time because during that time computers and everybody thinks they can do their own graphic design and it started to be harder and harder to get a decent job <coughs> doing graphic design work. And so graphic design jobs started to sort of naturally morph into marketing jobs. So I wound up taking on a marketing job with a printing company and the printing company was brand new and um, the owner of the company had big dreams and he wanted to have own a multi-company conglomerate and, and so during the time I worked for him he acquired seven other companies that I was simultaneously doing marketing for and that was a lot of uh, doing presentations to companies like Coke and Pepsi and uh, uh, lots of different Fortune 500 companies and I was the right hand to the president to the CEO of the organization and me helping make a lot of decisions and seeing what went on but his eyes were bigger than his stomach or work capacity <laughs> let's say and he started having to sell off and close down companies um, because he had not built a strong enough foundation and structure to balance all these very divergent types of businesses he was trying to manage at the same time. But that gave me a lot of insight um, into sort of risky financial thinking and you know I've always been a sort of hand-to-mouth person and not biting off more than I can chew and here I worked for a person that bit off more than he could even bite you know so um, I learned some valuable lessons there and part of it was not being so cautious but part of it was seeing the red flags coming down the pike so um, I uh, was laid off after several companies closed and, and things went down and found myself at 50 having a hard time, I was almost 50 at that point, having a hard time finding people in graphic design and marketing that wanted to take a chance on me. <coughs> That's kind of a young person's game these days and they think if you're over a certain age, not to mention women's value in the job place starts going down at 40 and a black woman's place in the job market really starts to go down. So I uh, got a job with a, an appraisal management firm where I was the vice president of marketing and, and throughout all of this I did fundraising and business plans and um, strategic planning and uh, marketing planning, managing budgets, all, all sorts of things like that. And that company was not stable and I was let go and found myself at this point post 50 trying to find a job and it took, uh, I was looking for jobs for more than full time for over a year and I was the runner up so many times and went through multiple rounds of interviews and, and worked my way to the back and to find out well what happened or why didn't that, and I universally was getting People were intimidated because you're so competent. They knew they'd have to pay you too much money. They could get someone else younger and cheaper. Um, everybody loved you, you know, but, but. And so at this point I had gone through most of my savings. I was preparing to move into my mother's basement and rent my house out. And I attended a party of a mutual friend with Priscilla from Fubs. And she indicated that she was wanting to go out of business. And, I approached her about buying it and she did not have an interest in buying. She did not have an interest in nurturing anybody through the process of learning and um, she just wanted to be done. At which point I thought, hmm, managing a toy store, you know, owning a toy store sounds kind of fun and interesting and, and I um, 
started to do some homework and, about the industry, and that's where my strong marketing and planning came into <coughs> effect, and I just did tons of market research to the point that I decided uh, this might be something to do. And I made a, an appointment with the Small Business Administration and sat down with them and showed them a business plan that I had come up with. They said I was on the right track and provided me with more statistics about this industry and this area. I was also looking for opportunities for, for help with funding um, and hoped that maybe I could get some uh, small business loans, grants, something. Uh, I could get support as a minority business enterprise. I could get support as a women-owned business, but as it turns out, Yellow Springs is not in a blighted community, and so there was no help available for me at all. Um, then I started going to financial institutions, and nobody lends money to startups. So that was another big hurdle to get over. And I had gone through all my savings and didn't know how I could possibly do this. Um, fortunately, I have some people in my family that have been fortunate in their lives, and and done quite well and I'm a very proud person I've never asked anyone in my family for help or money or anything before I paid my own way through college but I decided this was a sink or swim situation and I put together as strong a business plan as I could I joined, joined Dayton score where they match uh, match you with mentors and help and things like that and and they sent, they paired me with a CEO of a, a company in Troy. And he looked over my business plan and he said, I've read thousands of business plans in my life and if this isn't the best one I've ever read, it's close to it. And he said, I really have no feedback for you, but reach out if you need any help. So I presented the business plan to my family members who bankrolled me opening this business. And I owe them money, lots of money. It took about 200,000 to get, to just get the business in place. Um, I secured the space with Bob Baldwin and once Priscilla got her stuff out and I set foot in that space, I laid down on the floor and cried because the building was in such horrible shape, deplorable shape. And there was no breaks on rent. There was no help from the landlord to do anything. And I felt like I had bit off more than I could bite, you know. And um, fortunately, and we all share this, we are all essentially from Yellow Springs. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like being local has helped us all. And so I put a plea out on Facebook, and my significant other is a carpenter, and I'm like, it takes a village to build a toy store. And we had something like 1,700 hours of volunteer time. People, some people my friends, some people that were just invested in the toy store not going under and having a toy store in this town and some people that were just sold on the vision. And so we painted and, and there is not one inch of that space that we did not have to touch and, and make safe or safer. And a lot of it's cosmetic. That building is in horrible, horrible shape. Um, but the really great thing about it is that it made everybody in town have an investment in us making it and an investment in, in, in the toy store. And so I enjoyed really wonderful support from the community. Um, during COVID, people were buying gift certificates. And when I went online, people were buying things. We were doing deliveries like crazy and so I owe it to living in this town and the sense of community that I've survived this long and survived and thrived in spite of a lot of it. We're having a really good year. Um, the, the, it started slow but the past four months have been phenomenal. But I would say, you know, there are a lot of barriers to starting a business, especially just people with no resources. I think it's next to impossible. And um, Yellow Springs has a lot of, uh, has a shortage of space, and so landlords are not held uh, to a level of responsibility because, you know, if I try to get Bob to address anything, he's like, I got a line of people that want this space. 
and you should feel lucky. And honestly, I think that that's a big mm -hmm. sort of uh, common mindset among a lot of uh, a lot of landlords in town. And so, if you really take your time and look around downtown Yellow Springs, you will see that most of our buildings are in deplorable shape, and there's a there's not much space. So you have to be really creative about finding your spaces and creating opportunity. Um, because Yellow Springs is an ablative community, there's not a lot of aid available and a lot of, not a lot of access to funding. Um, our chamber is currently, uh, has a, there's no leadership there at the moment with Karen gone, Alex stepping away, and the chamber's focus wasn't necessarily on the downtown businesses. So we're working to build a downtown business association that looks out more specifically for the issues that the downtown businesses have. And, you know, we're seeing some issues with, you know, do we have too many tourists? How do we deal with some of those issues? And how do we deal with um, creating more of a sense of community again in downtown Yellow Springs? So, you know, I think it's important that we build a strong community that supports our businesses. And um, so I'd say that that's another area that hasn't been really strong and that we're working to make better. But um, I don't know. And I would say that Corey's, you know, my business plan had a, had a three year and a five year plan. That's gone out the window with COVID. It's minute by minute by minute. But she's absolutely right. And I've heard this from, and I have lots of mentorship from other downtown businesses who opened their books to me, shared their figures with me, uh, coached me through uh, staffing issues. So we have a really good community of people that really want to support each other and really work hard to support each other. But having an exit plan is a common theme that I've heard from everybody. Make sure you have an exit plan. So um, I don't know. I think that covers everything on do you know what percent of your customers are Yellow Springers versus tourists? Um, I would say it varies by business, but mine, it, yellow, and I think I want to make a distinction there between Yellow Springs and tourists, because there are visitors and there are tourists, right? And visitors are people from Oakwood and Dayton and Fairborn and Xenia and I like to feel like I'm not a tourist when I go to Oakwood and Xenia and you know so and so yellow I don't have an exact figure but I would say um, I would guess a third of my business is from Yellow Springs and um, all together including Yellow Springs when I talk about the local area I would say that's probably 80% of my business and I would say 20% of my business are visitors from farther away than that. And so a large percentage due to COVID online, what percentage of your business? Um, be well, no, I probably 10% of my business is, is online, but some of that is that I have a brand new, you know, when I shut down, I didn't have a website. And within two weeks, I had a website up and I was doing delivery and pickup. And, Having a website is a completely different business model than having a retail space and tracking inventory and how you do fulfillment and what types of things are selling are really drastically different. So coming up with that online business during COVID was like coming up with a completely new business model. And I have, I think, 28,000 individual items on my website right now, and that's not everything in my store. And so just continuing to get things on the website. And my website is okay, it's a work in progress. I'm getting ready to do a major revamp of it. But um, during COVID, I, I kind of pushed the advertising out. But there's so much that goes into a website. Your Google rankings and right. having, you know, all of the, all of, it's so complex how you get people to a website when you're a baby established business. And building a web presence takes time. And so once we reopened, I stopped pushing the website so much because I feel like, you know, across, and I do, and it's crazy. I get orders from around the country 
all the time. And it's like, how did they find us? How do they know what's going on? Or we'll get a run on one particular strange little item that all of a sudden people all over the country are buying. And it's like, what is going on here? And TikTok, somebody showed it on TikTok, and all of a sudden, everybody's gotta have this thing. And they look up this product, and it's not available places, and I'm the first place that's coming up that's got it. So I'm still working to build that web presence, and um, right now it's about 10% of my business, but I haven't been pushing it a ton. But my goal is to get the new version up in time for the fourth quarter, which is when, from a retail standpoint, we do, we do, you know, most of our business in that fourth quarter. So, and you know, we do, I do something like a quarter of my overall business in the month of December. Did you have trouble getting inventory going forward? Yes, that's, uh, and I think every industry industry is facing this. But normally, I have like you know, five or six orders with back orders, and then the back orders all come together. I have a folder this thick with back orders, and things are coming in one at a time. And fulfillment is awful. Just, you know, these, um, the, the ships that are bringing it in are getting stuck in the ports. And in the ports, you know, it starts with manufacturing, and 95% of toys are manufactured in China. And so, getting things manufactured then to the, the shipping destination, then to the United States, and then at the ports, there's nobody to unload things, and things are getting stuck there, and then they get unloaded, and they have to get on a truck. Well, the trucking industry is completely backed up. So by the time things are getting here, it's ridiculously late, it's ridiculously sporadic, and you don't know what you're gonna get, and I think you know, that's just a business-wide issue right now, is fulfillment. And, and people right now are, you know, at the beginning of the summer, were ordering for fourth quarter because they, weren't, they were worried they weren't gonna get things in, and they're still not getting things in, but you have to have a chunk of money to order that much inventory ahead. And in my teeny tiny space, how do I order enough stuff for Christmas when, you know, I don't have the space to store it? So that's been a huge issue, I think, for people in all industries right now, is fulfillment. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the Village Revolving Loan Program. Did any of you apply for loans? How did the Village treat you? Is there any money in that fund? So I was I'm on the YSDC, so I actually was part of that. So it's the Yellow Springs Development Corporation. The Village sent money to the YSDC to see this um, revolving loan. And then they turned it into uh, like a forgivable loan. So it was a revolving loan fund before that, before COVID. Okay, gotcha. And it's kind of dormant now, I think. No, there was a revolving loan fund. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is for twenty years. The village has had something. It's well, well and it got names. used for the space out by um, out by. Uh, Right, the the commercial the commercial the development CDE was and, bought with that money, and that revolving loan fund was established by the downtown businesses years ago, and that money was supposed to be paid back into the account for businesses, and so it hasn't made its way back there. But um, so the businesses didn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like something needs to be done to reestablish that. It looks sounds like all of you could have used some help. You said that SBA was pretty much worthless. With, uh, um, no, actually. Financing, I mean. Well, for, fi for startup financing, yeah. yes. I mean, there was advice. For startup financing, was yes. Because you lived here? You well, that was why I wasn't eligible for any sort of minority business funding uh, or any women owned business funding because they do that type of funding in blighted areas. But they, typically, they don't have money for startups. Nobody has money for yeah, they're, they're supposed to say, hey, you can go here. Uh, yeah, and they're, they're supposed to help. Person to that person. Yes, there's a bank. Or yes, or exactly. But they didn't do that. Well, they, they did, and they would have, but I already had that part developed. But they will help you come up with a business plan. They'll help to make appointments with you with different funding institutions. But when I went there, they said, the problem is nobody's 
financing startups. And I will say that the SBA is what got me through COVID. Um, and people are under the impression that, you know, we just got all these handouts. But when we shut down for COVID, as, as independent owned businesses, we did not qualify for unemployment. And so all of a sudden, all these business owners are put in a position where they're having to pay all their household bills and all of their business bills with no additional funds coming in. So there were two pots of funding made available, payroll protection program and the emergency disaster relief fund. And, um, and those monies were made available. But what people don't understand is those were loans. And so if your business was worth $100,000, you shut down because of COVID, so you didn't have any money coming in. And then you borrowed money to fill in this hole. At the end of this, you're still going to have to pay back this money that you never made the money to make up for. You just have an, an additional financial burden at the end of all of this. And your business is now devalued on paper. You had a $100,000 business. You took out a $50,000 emergency disaster relief loan. Your business is now devalued by, you know, by $50,000. And so um, the payroll protection funds, it was really disorganized. And of course, it was, you know, they, they were responding to emergency needs. And so they had a lot to work through. So it was a really clunky process. But um, I got the PPP, I got both PPPs. And those, you, if you used it the way they by these certain parameters, a certain percentage of it was forgivable. But you could use it for whatever you wanted to, and it wouldn't be forgivable. And so people had to decide how to use that, and then there was a lot of reporting. Well, in the end, the PPPs really pretty much are just being forgiven across the board, and that's fantastic. But I had to take out an emergency disaster relief loan that is going to come due, and it was supposed to come due June 2021, they've now bumped it to June 2022. It's a low interest, low uh, payment loan fund. And if business picks up and the economy keeps going, most of us should be able to make the, meet those payments. Um, but it's gonna be a hardship for some people to, to get that money paid back. And people don't realize the dominoes haven't really started falling yet as well as this as far as small businesses go, because a lot of us have been floated along, but there's going to come that time that we've got to figure out how to get that money paid back. So. We have any new thread here? Yeah. Uh, hi, Jamie. Uh, Todd Camp from Coco Cat Confections in Columbus. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, we have a, a family business, and I'm just interested in knowing from an outside perspective. Um, how does one come into a community um, looking to expand or, or you know, continue a business in a different location? We, we were here for the first time last week and absolutely fell in love with this place. And, She's yeah. also an artist, so we kind of I have the art degree also, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I gotcha. But um, uh, just interested in, um, you know, we're interested in raising our son in an educated community, a wonderful, um, diverse community and um, just found this to be a wonderful place. How does our business from sort of the outside come in? Well, um, um, Jamie, oh, let's, <coughs> you're, you're good. Okay. But let's, <laughs> try to spread sorry, it. I didn't mean oh, that. You're doing great. You know, I asked <laughs> you, so I answered. I'm sorry. But now, before you answer, how about a comment from others? Well, for, I'm assuming it's a, it's a bakery. Um, we're confections, so mostly artisan chocolates. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there. It started actually as a bakery. Um, my degree is in environmental science, so um, when he was born, I just drew from then what I've always done, which is chocolate and baking and art, and it just kind of all came together to to be the business that I have now since 2013. But um, so it's confections and chocolate. We also do a lot of dip fruit. Um, and we are a fulfiller for the greater Columbus area for Sherry's Berry. So that got us through COVID. But we closed our shop in the North Market during COVID. Gotcha. So now we're looking, we want to keep that production kitchen, but we want to, we're right now in Newark. So we want to come over to this side, the west side of that. Yes, and, um, and just again, like, 
No, he's an amazing, he's going to be 13 in 11 days. Has his own business. He has his own business, <laughs> and very entrepreneurial. And so, um, yeah, so mostly those, those con the artisan convections and chocolates and... So there, there's a new business incubator, sort of food-based space opening up that um, that's going to be in the lumber yard. I heard about that. All goes. So that may be a natural fit. Also, the um, in uh, what's it called? Millworks yeah. space. It has some. I, I think sometimes when I talk about like there's not a lot of um, places that feel like they've got potential for new life. You know, it's everything is just kind of like done, um, which can be frustrating. I think if you like to think about how to use spaces differently in town. So. Those are, those are the places that come to mind. And then as far as like getting to know the people in the town, I mean, that happens because it's a small community. And so no matter, what, as soon as your doors open, people are curious and they like to explore new things. And I think there's no reason that you know, people wouldn't be enthusiastic about trying something new. If I could add to, just before we leave this, um, in terms of funding, uh, ECDI, if anybody's familiar, um, in terms of startup uh, monies, uh, it's Economic... Uh, the Economic and Community Development Institute. Institute and they're uh, for the state of Ohio, so it's not, and it's really... There's a Women's Business Center. Yes. It's really good. They, I, that's who I checked with, and they don't. They didn't. Because mm -hmm. ah. it's through the Ohio Department of Development. The Women's Business Center, and then ECDI is its own thing, yeah. and they kind of sponsor There was nothing for you. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to tell you that you should talk, with their, uh, there's a business in the North Market, the pretzel company. Mm -hmm. I know, we know Brittany. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. So I contacted her right away. I'm like, Brittany, <laughs> what do you think of this concept? Um, the other part of it is that we do also, the, the social part is that, it's called Coco Cat, but we, um, we give money to groups that spay under feral cats and can for roaming cats, so we have that little piece of it that we nice. also want to plug into community awareness. There's another dimension, uh, not so much the retail, but such as web design, uh, served by uh, a new incubator, uh, co co Coactive? Coactive, yeah. Mark has just opened this place up. Uh, Mark, do you want to say something about sure. what you've noticed? Um, so we opened, uh, my wife and I opened Coactive Hill Springs in uh, January. So we're located on South High Street, uh, where uh, Real Publishing used to be. Uh, so we're in a residential neighborhood, so we're somewhat limited in terms of the types of members we can have. But what we do offer is professional office space, uh, mainly geared for folks that work uh, around a computer during their days. So it's for startups, freelancers, people that uh, want to move business from their home into a more professional setting. So we have both uh, options available for desks, and those start at $250 per month, and that's all inclusive, so that includes your internet, all of your utilities. Uh, and then we also have private offices available for rent, um, and those start at $500 per month and go up based on size. Um, so we have amenities like uh, you know, meeting rooms that are available on a schedule in addition to a conference room that can be scheduled by the businesses as well. Um, so right now we're, we've been open for six or seven months and we're about 50% capacity, but we're still growing so there's space available if anybody's interested in, in chatting now or in the future. That's a cool question. Um, I was hoping for uh, more retail uh, people, but um, and maybe you can answer that. Do you have any comments on the regulatory environment? Is, are there any uh, roadblocks that you think the village government has done in any way, or is there any way uh, the government can facilitate. Uh, no comments. A perfectly good answer. I'm just curious. <laughs> well, uh, the, the main thing is, you know, I mean, one difficulty I have with zoning, like just hanging my sign, turned into a gigantic fiasco, mm -hmm. and the village is in the process of bringing a building department um, that will give approvals for those sorts of things in house. So I think that would be really helpful for some similar blocks that some of us have faced as small businesses just trying to deal with county zoning for getting things done. Um, I think uh, from a retail question, uh, we're just working on building stronger channels of communication. Because in downtown Yellow Springs, we're all 
just trying to keep our buildings alive and we don't and our businesses alive and we don't know each other and we don't talk to each other. So I think it's our responsibility as downtown business owners to develop to start talking to each other and develop develop an avenue of communication so that people can come to us and, and get answers to things and we can't do have a, a more collective voice and and saying what it is we you know our concerns are and what some of our goals are collectively. Did the so, chamber let you down? You kind of mentioned that. Um, or well, are their focus is something else. You know, if you look message. at the chamber job description, it's not so much downtown business. You know, I mean, it's it's very broad and it's about bringing people here. And I think that they did a really great job of that. And um, the only problem is that you know we're starting to see some red flags of places that are overrun by tourism and I've been doing some research on that and it's how do we you know there's no plan for more parking or more infrastructure and we're just going come on come on and hey come and drink too you know what I mean and, and so you know, we feel like it's time to sort of reevaluate some of that and I think um, and I think uh, chamber leadership and board members kind of, if you look at, at their recent history of board members, it's a lot, of, and even membership, it's a lot of out of town entities that we're sort of having a say in what's going on here. And I will say when COVID hit, I felt like the leadership in this town didn't understand that we were facing a very real crisis and didn't understand that we needed help and support. And some of that I think is our responsibility as business owners to find a way to communicate that out and to educate people about us. And um, so I don't blame the chamber, I don't blame the village, I you know, I don't blame leadership, I blame us first of all. And I think when we address that, hopefully some of the issues that, that we're experiencing and some of the red flags we're seeing will start to get addressed. Uh, just fill up work. So for the panel, I do have a question for the people here outside of, um, we talked about finances and of course uh, village administration and things like that. But for people who are looking to possibly start a business in Yellow Springs, what is one thing that you would say that is beneficial about having a business in Yellow Springs? And what is one thing that you would say to be cautious of or just kind of put an earmark on as you move forward in establishing I think relationships are really nice in Yellow Springs. I've um, developed several relationships because of my business and um, uh, and just offhand, I mean, just, like I'd say the word of mouth and it, it, the small community is really nice because I do think people in the community, they know a local business, they want to work with it, you know, help, help that business make money. Um, the other thing is the negative, I would say you're not going to become rich with just local, um, with just local customers and clients. You need to look outside the city. Um, and I've, I have clients in Dayton, I've got clients in California. Um, kind of all over and I try to market my, I, my my ad says I'm local and I do um, I am proud of that but I uh, also market myself to people outside of Yellow Springs as um, I work I work with anybody so I mean I think if you limit if you think that you can find enough business within Yellow Springs you, you it, most businesses I know can't. I mean, especially downtown, with with you know, exception of Tom's maybe, um, because it's so that that's a that's a little different with tourism, but it's just the size of the town. It's nothing against the town itself. So. Um, I think my business is a little bit different. We, there's really no reason for us to be headquartered here, except that I live here and I wanted. I'm going to throw this thing. I want my taxes and you know all the taxes from my business to be going here because I live here. 
So that was just a choice on my part. Um, so the advantage for me is definitely biking to my office. <laughs> but the, the downside is um, that that like the the potential for other spaces. You know, I I was initially over on Z Avenue in the small building next to the doctor's office for a while, and then until that building sold, and now I'm over in Bushworks, and then there's all the sort of you know what's happening next door with this lumber company, and so I'm like, am I going to lose this spot and have to move again and have to do all of the work of transferring my business name and. Um, so that's kind of a hassle, I would say. It's, it's just not that easy to like find a spot and stay there for me. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. I really keep wondering, though, is it really no conversation about building more buildings for businesses, be it office space or storefronts to sell to the visitors? Anyone? Well, Millworks. Because like, that area I've seen mm -hmm. in particular, there's plenty of grass that nobody's even exercising on, or mm -hmm. sunbathing on, or using it all, or playing badminton. Um, Wait, but where? Like, near the, between Calypso and the oh, yeah. right? That mm -hmm. whole space, like, we could have more businesses built there. It's not detracting from anything if we, or office space. I think yeah, I mean, I think that the village would definitely be open to a developer that said they wanted to come in and buy land and build. It's just that, like, these projects, it's like, who's, well, who's going to do it? Everybody's... Okay, yeah, other so things open is <laughs> part of it. We, it. we are open. I've only been here a year, so oh, I don't oh, know. Oh, sure. If you can find property that's for sale, yeah. you're welcome to build whatever you want on it yeah. for the most part. Yeah. But, it, but and I think that takes a, a lot of capital, you yeah. know. So. Or converting this building. So that's the problem. Oh, that is there's not already. a lot of that. And is that because of the village rules? No, it's just because of everything's being used. Okay. Not, not everything, but well, converting. <coughs> what about uh, the Fells building? That used to be a business incubator. Does any of it? Yes. Yeah. Well, you can do something with it. <laughs> but that's the thing. That's got to be somebody's got to come and want to do it. Nobody's yeah. saying don't do it. You can't do it. Go away. I think people are going. Come on. Come on. <laughs> come on. And we need. We need real diverse industry in this town. We've lost all of our industry. And so, you know, part of it is the vision of who we are as a town and, how, and who are we trying to attract and how do we get those people here. And in order to attract businesses here, we have to have a viable, thriving downtown that allows these businesses to attract um, people that want to work for them. Mm -hmm. And we have to have affordable housing so that people that work on different levels. So it's really a much bigger picture than just, you know, it, 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 I mean, I think your space is a fantastic idea. And I think it's a, it's a fit for our town because we do, this is becoming a bedroom community, like it or not. And more and more people are working from home. So how do we get telecommuters here? And the, business, the village is putting in internet infrastructure in that will really help to support that kind of thing. And so I think that there's a lot of ideas. It's just people need to come with the money, the plan, and the, you know, and do it. And I think people will support it. I don't think there's a go away feeling, but I just think we need to attract more diverse industry, which I think is what part of what the Yellow Springs Development Corporation is trying to do, right? And trying to attract, well, Maybe not, but the chamber. <laughs> yeah, that's what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I was somebody trying to call should it be the somebody, chamber, but I don't have it. I mean, that plan. that needs yeah. to be part of the plan, and I'm sure it's part of the overall village plan. But um, yeah, more, more, more. Yeah, if you want to build buildings. But even I mean, now that the uh, lumber yard is has a plan, that's mm -hmm. terrific. But it's, there, there's more space there. Well, that whole space they, has been purchased, Millworks, and they have plans for that too. Mm -hmm. They just haven't made it public. But well, one elephant in the room is the campus. Yeah. I mean, you could mm -hmm. fire a cannon in there any time, and mm -hmm. cross cannons. You could have a Civil War battle reenactment there with live ammo, and no one would get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they've blocked up that whole side of town. Yeah. Who, who is the they, though? The college. Yeah. The college. No, but who is locking it up? Is there well, the university, they're I mean, they're not they don't, functioning well, they're, so they're sell not, off some um, buildings. Right? They're, 
they're having Use them for existential public. challenges, as they say. You are new yeah. here. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and I'm the, I'm the second newest person in the room, too. Maybe those people. But, I mean, they, they are a private entity. They can't be forced to do anything. No, no, that's not what I'm, I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah. What I'm saying is that if the, you know, talking about space and capacity and X, Y, Z, that's, that's a measurable percent of the village there. 10% of the whole place is, is the campus. So if you wanted to do, you know, if you wanted to buy, you know, if they wanted to sell, they're selling off assets, you know, the resources, um, there's property there, there's existing buildings there. I'm not saying that they should. And you know, the other end of town, you have Antioch, what is it, Midwest? You got a zillion dollar building sitting there with nothing going on. They're trying to sell it actively, but you know, who, what is, I, what's the, this multi-million dollar building and property and stuff? I thought I saw a number like $25 million building. Is, that's probably hugely conflated in my head, but you know, that's at the other end of town. And there's been a lot of, that's been a years and years and years mm -hmm. discussion, but we are not equipped to really address, but yeah. just so you know, the history of it, I mean, there were plans to put like a strip mall -y kind of, you know, place out there and have the infrastructure. The pot plant was not supposed to be the only thing out there and still may not. And I mean, I think that, that you know, the people that are working on development in this town, that's definitely a yeah. spot that's open for development. But it's just gonna take finding the people that wanna come here. Uh, you know, Antioch Midwest is moving partially because we're off the beaten path. And so it ha it's going to take special companies that want to come and headquarter here. And, um, and there's some challenges to getting businesses here. And our property taxes and the cost of living are getting to be sort of... Um, well, I like to think of it as like one of the things we love about a small town is that things change slowly here. And one of the things that drives us crazy when we're people who like to get things done is that things move so slowly. So when I think about Antioch right now, I just think of it it's kind of like the like the Earl's castle over there. And sort of like the power of the Earl has declined lately, but at one point the Earl used to have run the whole town. So, you know, all these businesses that are still here, like um, you know, on the edges of town like Morris Bean and and you know, publishing. So those were all from the Antioch, it's just that they're all separate now. So they have done a lot. It's just that right now it's just a transition. So we'll just have to wait and see what they do. Well, I have a vision that we could actually have a lot of uh, conventions like at the uh, using Antioch property in Midwest also. Like people coming in for, okay, I just saw there was a date in Comic Con mm -hmm. that, like last week or the week before, but I was thinking we should have an environmental film festival here. Like this is such an amazing place to do that, and that the festival, the film festival, right, or any kind of conference, can be you be held at Antioch. You've got classrooms, you've got projectors, you've got lecture halls, you've got dorms for people to sleep in right there, mm -hmm. right? Like they could be used in different and they, ways. And I don't know who to mention it to, but I see that as like. Is it is a, this is a project that you want to? Yeah, and I spoke to Catherine Zimmerman yeah. about it, and she's like, oh, yeah, just not this month. Okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, there are several people around town that are wanting to do these kinds of, bring a group of people in with a really specific mission and have some kind of a retreat, whether it's like um, art, arts retreat, artist retreats or writers or yoga retreats yeah. or this kind of thing, film festival. So I think that there is definitely, like, that's one category of, of um, business that there's a lot of energy behind. So I, I'd be happy to connect you with some of those other people that are interested in that and maybe mm -hmm. all together you'd be able to figure out some, some way to make it. Agraria mm -hmm. does a lot of programming there. Their parking lot yesterday was full morning to evening, like literally out to the, the road, full of people. Yeah, they've got camps yeah. this week too. You yeah. just need to come so up with a concept to talk er, Earlier to oh, yeah. in the discussion, no, okay. they brought up the issue that uh, space was a problem and now we're saying well actually we do have a lot of space resources but they're dormant. retail space that's different yeah I was talking retail space. okay yeah. Yeah. well 
Corey was talking about office space <laughs> and, and the, the grief of having to move. Uh, How do you think Coactive that? does provide space for individual tiny uh, business. Uh, and then another theme I heard was capital, startup money. I mean, if you don't have a family <laughs> or friends with money, but you have a great idea, how do you get support? How do you, where do you go to inspire? I, mean, there, I think there are still ways to do it on a shoestring and do it, just start from the very bottom and grow from there. I mean, that's what I did with my first store. It was, we had probably 25 things to sell. I mean, we, we practically gave blood to get the money to paint the store, you know, things like that. Like, we were <laughs> really just doing it all with sweat equity. But I was 25. I didn't have anything else <laughs> to do. Yeah. I didn't really have any bills to pay, and I was waiting tables, and I was acting, you know, it was just like, if you have the energy and, like, the complete openness of your schedule, you can absolutely do it without any money coming in. <laughs> I don't think you do it in Yellow Springs, because my rent was also, like, 400 bucks a month. You know, so it's a little different. Medic 81, rescue 81, 314 North Walnut, 314 North Walnut. Are, are there those who haven't asked questions? Female heart attack. Are there themes that haven't come up at all that uh, you're surprised no one has said X? And if it's just responding. Claire. Well, I would like to find out how many people are out. When someone's selling, is is it just word of mouth in town that mm -hmm. someone's just saying there's no online forum? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. There isn't, there isn't I've been right looking into that for over a year since I've been here, and there really isn't any formal way of finding that out. And unfortunately, I found that the, that when you do find what's available, the conditions of them are so horrific, and and also the prices are exorbitant. Like I, were, I was on a five-year lease, and how does someone coming into a brand new? I mean, that's just you know, no financial advisor is going to tell a brand new company that you should sign a five-year lease. Yeah, just not just not yeah. doable. So there really isn't any oh, great sorry, way of doing yeah. it. Is, can I ask what a typical rent is down downtown? Well, we're going to do a survey, and I think it varies widely. I mean, really widely. And for instance, I know of some people that took you know, over a space that was renting for seven hundred dollars a month, and they fixed up the space after and after three months, their rent went up to two thousand a month. Ted Donnell uh, used to own it was the with Auntie's place. Anyway, what is now the parking lot uh, along the bike path on Dayton Street. Uh, and the village owns the land. There was a, a period when they were talking about putting in, uh, well, building a building. And he just, he said, the per square foot cost of building a new building and how you would pay for it through retail rent would be enough higher than what rents were currently in existing buildings. One story, residential. And you're saying in very bad shape and on and on. And on uh, that it was a stretch for him to justify building a new retail space because the rents were too low. Well, now, where does that take us? And our spaces are really small. Yeah. So there's only so much you can make per square, you know. Mm -hmm. Retail, you talk about sales per square foot. Mm -hmm. And there's that only is. so many people I can fit in my store. There's only so yeah, much traffic. money I can make, even if I'm not. So I'm going to the intersection of Pinberry. So if my oh, rent gets tripled, it's not doesn't make sense for me to be in business. Yeah. And so that's a real issue that I don't know how how it gets resolved because in some cases to, to restore these businesses and these buildings, it would require rents that are really kind of unsustainable for the businesses that are so how many of the businesses downtown are kind of you know, you go tourist 
looking and stuff, and but you don't really buy anything. People come in and look, and and then they you leave. I mean, I, I've got it's places a lot. Like that. Yeah. And that's one of the things we're we're looking at because you know when you look at places that are overrun with tourism, like Venice, Italy, and you know there's a lot of studies out there about that. And we're starting to see these red flags where people in the community are saying, ah, oh, we hate the tourists. And, and unfortunately, that feel, negative feeling toward the tourists is transferring to our businesses. And the truth is, all of the people that are coming are not necessarily the people that are buying from our store. And so the people that did Pride, that did Pride, mm -hmm. proved that point. Like, because many, we had a, Gangbuster day, all of the stores downtown. Most of us did more than we do on a street fair. And there were 4,000 people in that town, in town that day, and people were pleasant and nice and fun, and the trash was getting in the trash receptacles, and it was a joyous day for all of us, and we did fantastic business. And that was 4,000 people versus 40,000 people coming in for street fair and we don't have the parking, and a lot of those people, the business is not feeding into the downtown businesses. And the sort of shotgun approach that's been do, done for marketing, come on, come on, is resulting in us having a lot of people that aren't really spending business, money in our businesses. So the downtown businesses, we're about to do a survey to try to figure out who are our customers and how do we target our marketing so that we have smaller, more manageable crowds. We don't want to say no tourists, no visitors go away, but the bottom line is you cross this line where it stops being pleasurable for the tourists that are coming to visit because they're having to stand in line and they, and there, there aren't, the, you know, the, only, the winds can only seat so many people. I can only fit so many people in my business. On busy days, I sometimes have long lines outside the door of my store. And so how do we, and then the people that are in there taking their time are not buying anything. And so how do we target our marketing as a community to bring in people that are actually supporting our business without overrunning our town with you know, uh, you too much trash, too much foot traffic, you. too much, you know, the town is getting kind of overwhelmed. You're clear, I did tell me you and Ralph, you said to drop the time, that's what I did. That the space in um, uh, Millworks is spread, because one of the strategies is you spread the okay, crowd spread out the a little bit, so that it's not such a hardship on physical spaces, on people's experiences. So I'm all for Millworks kind of becoming a, another area people can go, but... Um, I don't know. Is the street fair kind of uh, working against you then? Is you know, street saying? fair funds the chambers, yeah, uh, the know, chambers like operations. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, as a group of business owners, when we discuss it, some of us would just rather go away. Some of us would rather it's just, just fall. Let's just do the fall. Most people are fine reining it in a little bit, spreading it out a little bit. Some people would like it to be more of a juried, you know, more selective, so that the booths that are there are more representative of the types of businesses we have. And so I would say that since street fair hasn't happened three times, and what's going on at the chamber, it's the perfect time to examine street fair. It doesn't make sense for us and our infrastructure and the amount of parking we have and the amount of policing we have. Restrooms. Pardon? Restrooms. And the amount of restrooms we have, yeah. So, you know, and we as downtown businesses would like to get back a little more to the community and building more of a sense of community because we're feeling the alienation that a lot of the townspeople are feeling right now with downtown. So. Is the Mills Lawn Green space in discussion for some more retail space? It has to be sold as a private. <laughs> that, is, that is a good topic. Well, we, we talked, we had Mills Lawn two or three months ago. I want to leave that on the table for today. Could I make a comment? This is not levy related or even the green space. But if, you know, the school board wants the school to be relocated out to Eden Road, right? That's what they want, right? 
So in my vision, that footprint of the building should be added to the central business district and expand our central business district for more similar first floor retail, office space, whatever, and second floor residential, something similar. It's just the natural area for us to expand the central business district if that footprint ever becomes available. That's what I, I envision. The other thing, Jamie, I've heard, and I've asked business owners this downtown, even if, like, I ask them, did you get a lot of traffic during street fair, how was business? Oh, good, good, and, or what I expected. Is that, but a lot of those people who come in your store, like, they'll come back. Well, that's they always found been you. the argument. Well, that's what I I would kind of argue differently just because street fair is so overwhelming. They can't even see your logo. They just remember some weird little store they went into. And yes, I think as an overall situation, they're like, oh, Yellow Springs is cool. They've got cool little shops. Let's go back. I, don't, I think street fair serves a function, but I will say the amount of work and energy that it takes and output and staffing that it takes, that day itself is not necessarily, and I will say that pretty much all of us have done better in the months without street fair. I mean, when we haven't had street fair. So I won't say that I feel like street fair adds to our bottom line. I think like a lot of things that go on here, it brings, it brings people back to town. Um, but I don't even necessarily think it's a great connector with my store because I feel like they're so overwhelmed with everything they're seeing. And some stores don't have a presence out on the sidewalk and some people don't even make it into the stores. And a lot of what happens at Street Fair is this parade of people coming through and leaving, you know. And so yes, sales are good that day. But as I said, we all did better with Pride when there were 4,000 people in town and there wasn't so much, and people were actually making connections with our businesses and not so much this big festival and these cool shops, you know, so. So you, you might consider doing what Asan has done, is they bring their store out onto the street. Oh, my, I have a tent right yeah. now. Yeah, well, and that's a way that people No, I have a huge yeah. tent in front of so. my store. Yeah. How about another question in the back? Yeah, why is Street Fair downtown? Started as sidewalk sales. It, start, it was started by the business, the, the downtown businesses, yeah. as a means of of creating community in downtown business. And it used to be that the streets weren't blocked off, except for the local doodah parade or whatever that that kind of fun towny parade. But it sort of morphed into this other thing. And we do need things to build our economy. We do need things to connect people to our businesses. Um, but well, that, that's not my question. The question is why, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, why don't you do street fair out at Antioch Midwest in that huge parking area and all that, and you have restrooms inside the building, and you can have cooling stations in the building, and you can have some vendors in the building, and uh, just move it out there. They have openings yeah, on the chamber, the chamber board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no good deed goes up punish board. Is that the board you're talking about? So, James, do you board. think that in part the discount, you know, the discount coupon things that they had for Pride helped bring people into the stores to purchase? Um, they haven't done it what I heard is that hardly any of those got used. Oh, really? Okay. But the really good thing was that Pride built this whole element with the downtown businesses yeah. into it. And certainly that handout they had that's like, visit these businesses, okay. help to bring people in. Yeah, I think so, for sure. But it's interesting that nobody really used the coupons. Yeah. <laughs> no. I have a couple questions or themes. One is the <coughs> attracting business versus growing your, our own business. Uh, you spoke of the chamber putting energy into, you know, selling the town, attracting business. Uh, but you mean attracting so when you list, when you, visitors? Attracting was, no, visitors. I, no, I'm talking about new business, okay. starting business. a business, or bringing existing businesses in, versus growing them from the people who are already here. And the history of our town, you know, the industries that developed, they started here. They, they weren't 
brought in and they weren't wooed. Is there anything like that going on now? Are we growing our own? See, I think that um, there, the size of the town is so small that the percentage of people that you want doing that. Um, I, my business expense wasn't anything like yours. Mine was a laptop, a printer, and um, a nice monitor. So my, my capital expenses weren't that large. Um, with the retail, you know, that to sit there and say $100,000, to start a new business, you've got, I mean, you've got so many, you've got, four, we have 3,500 people in town now, or 4,000. 4, I mean, you, you take a, what percentage of those would want to start a business, and then what percentage of those would want to spend the money to really start a retail business. Um, I think that there just isn't enough people there. Is that what you're talking about, retail businesses? No, I was anything? thinking of any kind of business, but, I mean, uh, how many people are mowing lawns? How many people yeah. won't clean gutters? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, these are business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think part of the, yeah, I think that there's, there's some people that are interested in starting businesses and there are other people that are happy to work for somebody else. And I totally get that. But there's, it, this, this is not a cheap place to live. So that definitely does not, like, you know, if you're talking about somebody that's in their 20s that's going to start something like a Morris Bean or a YSI, I just, I don't know how how somebody could start something up like that here yeah. as it is now. I think those and days are over. Those days are over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with COVID and the new economy, you know, your business yeah. is great, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can go outside of town. I don't know what percentage of your business is in town versus out. But how do you attract those? those people that uh, work remotely. And that's what I think it's company. Company. exactly. That's just yeah. the new model. Or yeah. somebody that's okay. starting then, some I mean, tech you company. Got, you got more then you're, say, you're, you're answering, I, I'm hearing you say how, <clears throat> I ask how would you help people uh, grow it, start a business here, and you're saying look at this new model, the internet-based other uh, home-based professional skill businesses. Incubator. Are there examples? Incubator, yes. yes. Coactive. This guy, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. people are looking for a life like this town offers and maybe live in California. Most, mm -hmm. most of our members thus far don't don't you know? I don't live in Yellow Springs or down in Senior or South Charleston or they move from New York City. I mean, those type of people that are actually setting roots down, or at least temporarily setting roots down within co-active. So I haven't seen a lot of, you know, community-based folks move in so far other than the, the karma point people, the, you know, the butchers. But um, so far, that's the type of person we're tracking. I think we're not talking about the elephant in the room, which is the comedy club and all the buildings downtown, which are owned, but we don't know what the purpose of them is going to be. It could change the entire character of the town depending on what goes in there. And I don't know whether you all knew about Union Schoolhouse before it was announced, but is this what's going to happen to us? Are we going to have surprises just appear? I think we need to somehow know what the game plan is for those properties so that we can react properly to them. I wonder if anyone has approached, what is it, Iron Works? Iron Table. Yeah. I think they're privately owned, so it's hard to say you have to tell us. I mean, yeah. and they will. But has anyone asked? Yeah. Yes. And some and some of it's been disclosed, and some of it hasn't. And I've asked in detail, and I, you know, I think, but you can't force people to tell it's you. Across but, the street from you. Yeah, but they have to. And I've talked to them, and I, you know, they do have a vision, but it's it's a vision, and so, you know, it, it, Max Chrome has come back to Yellow Springs to oversee the development of all of those properties. He's a, a 
a well-respected architect who grew up here. He has a firm in San Francisco where I think 14 full architects work for him and a lot of other people. They do work all over the country. And he has pushed that work all over the country off on the people that work for him. And he is moving back here with his wife, who's also an architect, and grew up here as well. And um, they, are, you know, have, and they're opening an architecture firm here. So that's another business that's coming here. And it makes me feel a little better to know that people that grew up here and have a good community vision of who we were at that point, you know, and who we sort of hopefully still are at our core, and that being a big part of the thought process and decisions that are going in. And from what I've seen, a lot of it's a labor of love almost, more than something, you know, as you were saying, it's like, you put all this money into these buildings, you're not going to start, it's not a financial investment. It's a labor of love. Anybody that is fixing up these buildings, it's, you know, and the bottom line is, we need someone with those kinds of resources to come in and save our crumbling buildings, <laughs> or we're going to have a flat in downtown. Now, you know, do I have some questions and concerns and reservations? I think we all do. But um, knowing those things and knowing the people involved have made me feel a little more comfortable with it. And they do have to go through zoning so approval. Same, it's and the they same have zoning to go, that you have to live with in the so downtown. So it exactly. has to somehow, if the zoning and community have some parameters set up that say, you know, if you're building in Yellow Springs, you have to keep this in mind. You have to follow these rules. There will be a certain amount of oversight of what's developing here that it can't, that it won't just be something that's completely out of character for the town. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, I think that question is completely wrong-headed. Uh, very little of the Chappelle properties uh, have been uh, retail and uh, taking the uh, old firehouse and the school and turning them into something that they weren't before, I, I don't see how that can possibly be harmful. And uh, so I, I just, I think it's just a, it's a wrong question. I didn't interpret it as implying harmful. It's what's the flavor? What's the right. new? Who cares? New Somebody's doing something. What's the new right exciting thing? We could be taking nothing right. and turning it into something. The uh, Bait Street building was been in the paper and a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's an right. ISO thing. So there's some. Here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going with this property. So like, as a private company, as you say, they going to feed you a little bit at a time once they figure out what they're going to and do. Part of it's but still, we can keep right. asking those questions. Yeah. You know, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? So. I see it. I'm hearing it, uh, this interesting spectrum of we want change because that's the title of this event, right? <laughs> How to start starting a business. A, yeah, so that's new. <laughs> that's change. Starting mm -hmm. a new business. New is in that title. But yet, too new is scaring us mm -hmm. because we don't have a sense of what it is if it's on a larger scale that one company is owning all these buildings. But one of the things that has helped me be more calm in life is welcoming the idea that every minute of our lives is different from the minute before. There's nothing we can do about change. It's just going to happen because it's just part of life. And that's part of what's happening in town. And I've only lived here for a full year. I've been coming for 23 years. So I just want everyone to know. <laughs> no, I didn't I've been here for 23 years. My mother lives here. So I've been coming constantly, multiple times a year. But I've been here the full year now. So I see it as this is such an awesome community. This is such a fantastic gem in the Midwest, in any part of the US, in any part of the world. And I've lived all over the world. So this place is is worth protecting and fighting for and discussing and expressing fears over. But like, let's just ask Dave, let's keep asking him and say, what are you thinking now? Or here's what I think you should do. <laughs> and I tell you, I influenced him to get on Andrew Yang's campaign. I did it because <laughs> I was committed. I said, that man needs to get on because he just tweets once and everyone in the world will know about Andrew Yang suddenly. And that is what happened. Now he didn't win, but 
right? He's the champion, and I knew he was the good person to be the champion, but we can plant seeds and get him to do both good for the town, which is what I assume he's doing, but also just tell us more of his thoughts, right? Or say, let's all work together. And so my, so my other point, you asked, like, uh, this is the event. I can't remember the phrase in your question, but this is the beginning of understanding of who wants to create new business in town, right? This is the moment. You posted an event, and now we're all talking about whether it's training new people to do coding, to build websites, or to have brick and mortars. The co-active space is fantastic for this. I've spent more than 12 years in startup space at a whole bunch of different incubator and co-working spaces, and I actually was part of creating a green co-working space. I tell you, there is, there's so many resources, and if the town, townspeople, everyone wants to help train more young minds of how to run a business, like, you know, you know, you know. This is fantastic. That's how it happens. And you don't get paid, right? You just volunteer your time because it's labor of love, because it's what we want. We want growth, and we want to make sure it's done in a healthy way. And the only way to do it is to be invested, spend time, go to the meetings, and participate, and be educated and vote, right? Like, these basic things that we can do to make this an amazing town where people who do want more out of their own lives can have access and not waste time going to how many different places looking for money and being turned down, but like actually motivating each other and teaching these basic skills. Because the exit strategy, that's really important and you brought it up, right? Like people need to know that before they start the business. But if you don't know anything about business and you're not going to go to business school, but you still want to start something small, it can be done because the knowledge is here in this room. And a whole bunch more people will, can volunteer, right? Like Mark, we could do, we talked a few months ago in COVID still, but like having events in your space, it's terrific yeah, to start like, training. Well, about having, you know, business e after hours events, right? Yeah, so evening events. Like every night. People to organize it and make it happen. We yeah. have the Chamber of Leadership right now. I used to do that, now we're out of COVID. Hopefully, we don't go back into it, but, but assuming that you know everybody's willing to, I'm happy to have people out once a, once a month, once every two weeks, whatever it needs to be. Well, we are <coughs> coming to the end of an hour and a half. Uh, and I can, I can see a whole, a couple themes. I don't know that the key group is going to focus on this, uh, but space, money, shared experiences uh, all seem to be uh, issues to be worked on by the business community or by others in town. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask, you said you're doing a, a survey of like the where the customers are coming from who's who's actually doing that or so uh, I am <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, during COVID I started a Facebook group with Brittany Baum and um, we started uh, we got 50 three downtown members to join, and it became a place where we got support. What are you doing about masks? How are you handling hand sanitizer? There's, the, look at the shoplifter in my store, be careful. Um, here's where you apply for PPP. Here's you, where you apply for EIDL. Hey, nobody in town seems to know we're, we're struggling, and you look at all these other communities that are doing things for their downtown businesses, let's get the chamber let's talk to village leadership um, you know we got some funds released uh, to the downtown businesses uh, you know small pockets of funding um, so it's this group is sort of arisen out of a need and we sort of went a little dormant but with the um, the Dora and the fact down that Xenia Avenue was closed without any of us knowing one day, the fact that somebody is purchasing a large percentage of downtown, and that is going to affect us all, no matter what. 
Um, the fact that none of us talk to each other and know each other and collectively we have a lot of the same issues and collectively we have a stronger voice and collectively we're the largest employer in town, we're the largest taxpayer in town. Collectively, if we can get on the same page, um, we can create an avenue for people to come together. So actually Dave Chappelle, um, I, I wanted to get the business owners together so that we get to know each other and he um, hosted us, and we had a business owner only event, which brought 69 people to the table. We are now in the process of dividing into subgroups, learning about all of the community organizations, coming up with marketing and public relations plans, um, figuring out how to partner with the existing leadership in town to help express what our needs are, and what our opinions are about things. Because like when the door went up for a vote, it said that all the village, all the businesses were on board. And we posted on that page, how many of you were asked about this? None of us, you know? And most of us were not for it. So it became apparent that we needed to somehow create an avenue of communication and an avenue of accountability. And so we're in the process of forming a downtown business association. And part of that is going to be a, a benchmarking survey of the businesses in the downtown district <coughs> to, to figure out how much are you paying for rent per square foot? How many, what's your average customer? Uh, you know, how many average customers do you have in a year? What is, you know, we want to sort of try to find some metrics to compare to see who we are. How much do you pay in taxes every year? How much do you, how, how much do you pay? to employ people every year? What is your base rate of pay? You know, something that helps to get us all on the same page and helps us understand what's going on. So this is a unofficial organization. We are now up to 69 members and um, we're splitting out into different groups and, and trying to figure out how to have a voice and collectively who we are together. And a benchmarking survey is gonna be part of what we're going to do to understand ourselves more. So. Well, in closing, <laughs> each of you have a final word? Don't have to? Uh, not really. This, the, um, it's a good town. It, if you can find your niche, it's a good town to have a business. That's basically, I'm happy with that. I think about just that we're just on this kind of temporal treadmill, you know, time is going to go and things are going to change and not taking action, things change, and taking action, things change, and so I would rather be a person who takes action and makes change around me, and then I know that I will enjoy what I have because I made it. So even if it is a disaster, I did it myself and I learned something from it, and there it goes in the rear view as I'm on to the next thing. So. Uh, you know, I think we spend a lot of energy in this town building systems to um, make sure that whatever happens, it, it happens, that it meets our values, and we, you know, got the zoning board, and they come up with values, strong values, and then they're making decisions based on that, and then we don't, then I personally am not afraid of the decisions that they made, because I see who's on that, and I see that they've spent the time to come up with you know, the framework for these decisions, and then I don't have to fear that the decisions are going to be misaligned with mine. And so some, maybe sometimes they are, but that's okay. That's just one decision, and away we go on. So that's, that's how I And good luck. <laughs> good luck to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Paul? Yes, we have three elected officials in the room, two of which are up for you know, re-election with some sign-up sheets. Anyone that would like to contribute a signature, meet with these two people. Thanks. Three or two? Mm -hmm. Two that are running. No, three of us running. Are, are you running? Okay, sorry. Yeah. I have a